Good morning, Cathedral of Faith. Come on, somebody say good morning to me. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. This is the day that the Lord has made. Anybody else going to choose to rejoice today and be glad in it? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Just wanted to start with a scripture this morning. You know that worship doesn't start when we think we ought to worship. It starts from God's goodness, God's action. Somebody say amen to that. It doesn't start, we don't start worship. We respond with worship. And in the Bible it says, Psalms 126, it says, when the Lord restored the, for the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Again, Cathedral of Faith, we don't come here and have the wisdom to say we need to worship the Lord. We respond with worship unto the Lord because he has done great things. Now before we start, just take, take 10 seconds and think back on this week. What has God done? Has he sustained you? Has he provided for you? Are you healthy? Are you free to come and gather? He has done great things. We are able-minded, we are here. We are able-bodied, we are here, and we respond with worship. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout, he has done great things. Come on, one more time, point to your neighbor and say, he has done great things. Put your hands together with us like this, come on.
together to say he has done great things say he has done great things now from the bottom of your heart say you have done great things one more time you have done great things oh somebody shout hallelujah to the Lord this morning let us worship him today we love you father
shouted how many are grateful for amazing grace this morning come on that is reason enough to praise God this morning let everything that hath breath in this moment come on praise ye the Lord for more just another second or so come on lift the praises unto him not unto the song not unto the lights not unto the music it's unto you and you alone God we love you we bless you and we shout your praise in the sanctuary. And before we're seated, we all God's people shouted, amen and amen. Come on, one more time, hallelujah. You may be seated. Hello and happy Sunday. My name is Stephanie and I want to welcome you to the Cathedral of Faith. If this is your first time, welcome. We would love the opportunity to get to know you better. We are so glad that you are here today. We have a new welcome card that you can find on the back of the seats if you're in the sanctuary. Or if you're in the drive-in or the amphitheater, our ushers and greeters have them as well. You can take the card and you can scan the QR code and fill it out digitally, or you can turn it over, fill it out, and hand it to one of our ushers and greeters. Also, at the end of service, if you have a few minutes, come by the amphitheater, grab a free cup of coffee, and meet some of our pastoral team. Also, if you haven't heard, we have a new Cathedral of Faith app. You can download it from the Apple Store or the Google Store, wherever you get your apps. It has a lot of fun new features and ways for us to get you the latest and greatest that's happening around Cathedral. So download the app today and let's stay connected. This is one of my favorite times of year. Pumpkin spice is back on the menu, the weather is cooling, the leaves are changing, and the Dodgers are in the playoffs. Or not. Or not. Are you doing the announcements? <laughs> Did you hear me say? <laughs> Look at his shirt. Hello. Hello. That's what I literally said. And the Dodgers are in the playoffs. That also means that Christmas is coming. Christmas is such a fun time around here and we are already preparing for this Christmas season. And we would love for you to come and volunteer with us. Whether you act, sing, dance, you wanna help with stage tech, set up or tear down, we would love to have you. Our World of Arts Department is looking for volunteers. Visit the kiosk in the lobby 
or call the church office. Well, that's all I have for today. Be sure to follow us on social media, check out our new app, or visit our website for the latest and greatest. I hope you have an amazing week. Well, good morning, Cathedral family. It's great to be together in the presence of our Lord. Amen. Thanks for joining us, whether you're in the parking lot, in your car, in the amphitheater, here in the building, or whether you're watching online or somewhere around campus. We believe God has something very special prepared for you today. I hope you'll connect with us. And as Stephanie said, Christmas is coming. One more request. If you know anyone who has a sheep, we're looking for one for Christmas. Just call the church office and let us know. How fun. Well, for 57 years, there's a prayer that has guided everything that we do here at Cathedral of Faith. It's a prayer that goes like this. Lord, help us hear the cries no one else is hearing. Help us see the needs no one else is seeing. And help us care about those for whom no one else is caring. That prayer has opened us up to hear, to see, to have an open heart. But in the end, the love has to be lived out. And I want to take this moment to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of the thousands of families each week who receive food because of you. Thank you on behalf of all those homeless people whose lives we are transforming as we touch them and serve them. Thank you in advance for the affordable housing that we're in the process of putting together and the hundreds of families that you're going to bless in this community. Thank you, Cathedral family, because of your generosity. University Preparatory Academy has educated thousands of young people who are serving all over the world. And thank you for the over a million dollars in scholarships you've given to kids to go into college. Thank you for your generosity. You know, it's just an amazing thing. It's an amazing privilege God's given us. He puts us in the city to bless the city. He puts us here to let his love flow through us. And there's an important truth. God loves to bless us, but there's one reason why he blesses us. He blesses us to raise our standard of giving. Notice what I didn't say. He did, I didn't say to raise your standard of living. God blesses us to raise our standard of giving. And I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness to do that. Every week we take this moment to remind you about the goodness of God and our opportunity to give. Some of you gave this past week online. Some of you mailed checks in. Some of you did electronically. However you worship, that's part of what we do. We worship by giving as God raises our standard of giving. And so there are several ways you can do that. You can take an envelope and in the service hand it to one of the ushers. You can go online. You can go to our app. You can write out a check at home and mail it in or drop it by the office. God wants to raise your standard of giving so that we can continue to be a blessing to our city. Amen? Well, it's a great privilege today to have all of you here with us, but we also have some special guests with us. I'm going to invite Matt Mann to stand up and his wife Sylvia and Nina and Luke are here. Matt is one of our council members here at, in, at San Jose running for mayor, and we're just so grateful for all you've done to serve our community, and may God richly bless you and all that he puts your heart to. Amen. Thank you. God has a great word prepared for you. As you know, we're walking through the Ten Commandments. Pastor Ken's been praying, is seeking the Lord, and this week we go to commandment number five. Let's turn our attentions to the screens as we get ready to hear that next command of the Lord for our lives. I'm not letting you get a boyfriend. Why not? Because you're not getting one. Dad, I can get a boyfriend if I want to get a boyfriend. Daddy will break his legs. No. Yes, I will. Dad, I'm... And guess what will happen after that? What? See your boyfriend's daddy. Mm -hmm. Daddy will take him hostage and keep him in a cupboard. Dad, listen. I want a boyfriend. I want a boyfriend. I'm getting a boyfriend. You're not getting a boyfriend. You're going to be a nun. You're going to be a nun. You're going to work for Jesus. They're who you're going to work for. They're who you're going to work for. End of story.
<laughs> ah, parents and their children. Hello, Cathedral family. God is good. And all the time. It's so good to see you again. Thanks so much for being here. Whether you're in the building, outside in the amphitheater, in the parking lot, in our drive-in, or all those who are watching online and the different campuses around the Bay. So great to have you on this journey. We are taking a deep dive into the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of the scripture of the day as we turn our attention, as Dr. Wayne said, to the Fifth Commandment. It has to do with parents and children. And I invite you to read this out loud with me. Let's fill this place with the word of God. Everyone read it with me. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord is given you. Can we say that one more time? Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Full life. Say that with me. Full life. I've mentioned before that these 10 words are known as the 10 commandments, but you really could call it 10 steps to the good life. Because when by the grace of God, you lean into the law of God, there you discover the life of God, the life of God that's given out of the love of God. Can someone say amen to that? What would it look like for us to put this into practice? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this moment in time. Thank you for all these wonderful uh, folks who are here today joining us this weekend, cathedral family and friends and guests. And God, thank you for how you've already been uh, inviting us into your presence and to focus in on you and you've already been speaking to us but I pray that in these next few moments a lot of things will be said let us hear the one thing that we need to hear so that life will be different this week as we lean in to the life that is found in your law start with me oh God and it's in Jesus name and for Jesus glory we pray this all God's people said Amen. One more time. Can we give God praise? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Full life. Say that with me. Full full life. Before you're seated, tell somebody, full life is headed your way. Go ahead. Full life. That's what these commandments are about. I saw this one comic where these two little girls are looking at a scale and one says, don't step on it, it makes you cry. <laughs> and so here's the question I want you to think about. Do you treat your parents as lightweights or do you treat them as heavyweights? The Hebrew word for uh, honor actually means weight or weightiness. So in a sense, to dishonor your parents would be to treat them as having little importance, little significance. Uh, to regard their needs or their values or their thoughts as having little weight. To honor them, on the other hand, would be to treat them with a lot of significance and a lot of importance to treat their values and their, their thoughts and their needs that you would give them a lot of weight. So again, let me ask you a question. Are you treating your parents as lightweights or are you treating your parents as heavyweights? Now, honoring father and mother, I don't know how those words sound to you. Now, this last week, uh, it was my dad's, uh, it would have been my dad's 92nd birthday. He passed away four years ago, and I was thinking about my dad, and I have all these wonderful memories of my dad and my mom, and so when I hear the words fa honor father and mother, man, my mind is just filled with all kinds of warm thoughts. On the other hand, though, yeah, yeah, let's give it up for our founding pastor. He was an awesome dad. 
On the other hand, though, maybe you didn't have parents that were honorable. In fact, the parents you had maybe were dishonorable. Uh, Singer Kelly Clarkson um, had a dad who abandoned her. And that's reflected in one of the songs she sings. It's called Piece by Piece. And here's what she says. She says, all I remember is your back walking toward the airport, leaving us all in your past. I traveled 1,500 miles to see you, begged you to want me, but you didn't want to. What if you have an experience like that? Does this verse have anything to say to you? Now, it's interesting. If you look at the verse carefully, it doesn't say honor your good father, but dishonor your bad father. It doesn't say honor your good mother, or dishonor your bad mother. Instead, it seems like honor has to do with the position that they're given versus the kind of person that they are. And when life gets messy, and it can get messy, how can we live out this principle before God and take hold of the full life that he has for us? What would it look like to treat our parents instead of lightweights We're going to treat them as heavyweights. Well, here's three ideas to get us started. The first one has to do with this. When you're younger, you can honor them through your obedience. When you're younger, you can honor them through your obedience. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents. This is the right thing to do because God has placed them in authority over you. Honor your father and mother. This is the first of God's 10 commandments that ends with a promise. And this is the promise that if you honor your father and mother, yours will be a long life full of blessing, full of blessing. So the key word when you're younger is obey. Would you say that with me? Obey. That means if your parents ask you to look both ways before you cross the street, you look both ways before you cross the street. If they ask you to help them with the dishes after dinner, that means you help them with the dishes after dinner. If they ask you to be home at a certain time, that means you be home at a certain time. I heard about one dad, he told his daughter, I want you home at midnight from your date. And the daughter said, well, dad, I'm not a child anymore. And he said, that's why I want you home at midnight from your date. (laughs) Obedience is really a key component because what we're doing in the home, it's a little bit like teaching your kids to ride a bike. The home is where they learn to ride a bike with training wheels. Does anybody remember training wheels? When we're riding with training wheels, we're getting a feel for what it's like to ride a bike. Now, we don't use training wheels forever because eventually we take those wheels off. And as adults, we're riding that bike around the block all by ourselves. But what they're learning in the home, it's like training wheels. They're learning how to respond to authority. They're learning how to respect authority. They learn that when they're young in the home Because one day they're going to be out of the home, but they're still going to have to respond to authority. I heard about this one kid. He was fed up with his parents and he said, I'm moving out of here and I'm joining the military. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. (laughs) Well, guess what? They tell you what to do when you're in the military. And you run into authority throughout your whole life. When you work, they tell you what to do. When you go to church, there's spiritual authority. Wherever you go at college, they tell you what to do. I mean, you always are going to have to uh, deal and relate to authority. And the home is, well, God gives those parents, the mother and father, authority so that the kids can learn to respect and relate to authority. Now, the parents obviously are not meant to misuse that authority. In fact, in Ephesians chapter six, that passage goes on to say this, 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Yeah, that's a great verse, isn't it? So parents aren't to misuse or abuse their authority. Now, if earlier generations had a tendency to overdo it when it came to using their authority, it seems to me it started with my generation and it's even got worse. We've swung way to the other side and we've abdicated our authority. And so we've seen a generation raised up that doesn't know how to relate or respect the authority that they run into. And so I guess today I'm urging parents, wherever you're at, to take back the role that God has given to you in your children's life. God has given you authority so that you can raise those kids that when they become adults, they know what it means to relate to that authority. Even Jesus himself had to put the training wheels on. We don't know a lot about Jesus' early life. We know that he grew up in a blended family. He had a mom and he had a stepdad, Mary and Joseph. And at one time, they took him into the city and they lost track of him. And if you've ever lost track of your child, you know then what the parents were feeling in that moment. They were stressed out. Now, Jesus is in the temple, and he's talking with the pastors who are in the temple. Now, the pastors are really impressed with Jesus, but when the parents find Jesus, they're not that impressed. So it's a tense moment within the Holy Family. And yet, even Jesus in this moment, have you ever thought about this? Jesus was the only 12-year-old who really did know more than his parents. <laughs> but even Jesus the Bible said, had those training wheels on. And it said that he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. So when we're younger, that's one way we can honor our parents. Obey, say that with me, obey. Now that brings us to the second way that we can honor them, that when you're older, you honor your parents through your gratitude, through your gratitude. The Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, no matter what happens, always be thankful, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Always be thankful. Thankful. Say that word with me. Thankful. One man who's a part of our cathedral family sometime back, he came up to me after a service and he gave me a card well, he showed me this card that his daughter had given to him. Now, at one point in his life, he was not connected to God. But eventually, he became a follower of Jesus. And after that, his life began to change. And his daughter wrote him a card. And this is what it said. It said, Daddy, I don't think I've ever told you how happy I am that you've changed for us. I'm so proud to have you as my dad. You really are the best dad anyone could have have. I'm so lucky. I love you so much. Your daughter, Samantha. And then she put a little heart at the end of that card. Isn't that a great note? How would you like to receive a note like that? Well, that brings us to our cathedral challenge for the week. If you're on site, you should have received a card that looks like this. It's a thank you card. And the cathedral challenge this week is to take this card and write a thank you note to one of your parents for something that you are grateful for. Oh, wait a second. Time out, Pastor Ken. It's not even Mother's Day or Father's Day. I know. That's what will make the card even more meaningful. Oh, wait a second. Time out, Pastor Ken. You know, my parents, they've passed away. Go ahead and write the note anyway. Share it with your kids. 
Share it with your grandkids. Just writing that note will do something that is good for your soul. If you're wondering what you can thank them for, well, you can start off with thanking them by giving you the gift of life. That's a pretty big deal. That they're the ones that God used to bring you into the world so you can thank you, thank them for bringing you into the world. You can thank them for all the sacrifices that they've made. I read that the average child is $286,000 in the United States to raise a child. You can thank them for the wisdom that they had shared with you. My dad's words still echo around in my head. I mean, words like, anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. You can thank them for putting up with you. Hello! My parents, I don't know how they put up with me. I was in three wrecks before I was 18 years old. And they say that they were all my fault, whatever. (laughs) How did they put up with me? I was on the dean's list more than I was on the honor roll. How did they put up with me? Right down the street, I took my BB gun to Oak Hill Cemetery and used the peacocks for target practice. How did they put up with me? Who does that? Oh, my. So that's what I'm going to write to my mom this week. Thank you for putting up with me. What are you going to write? What can you write on that card? You see, you can thank them for putting up with you. I I read that... um, that redwood trees, redwood trees, uh, that when you look at redwood trees, you can tell how many years those redwood trees are by the rings that they have. And if they have uh, the number of years by the number of rings, but you can tell whether the years are easy or hard according to the size of the rings. So if the ring is wide, it was an easy year. If a ring was hard, it was a narrow year. Let me ask you a question. Here's what I want you to think about. Do redwood trees have teenagers? And if they did, would they have a lot more stressful rings? See, the only thing harder than being a teenager is raising a teenager. So again, what can you thank your parents for? You know, it's so easy in our day. We get on social media and we look on at everybody else's parents. They just look so perfect. And then we know our parents weren't perfect. And then we're jealous. And then we get bitter. You know, uh, Forbes magazine ran an article a while back about the fact that, well, how social media can shape our moods. This is what it said. Facebook has been linked to a surprising number of undesirable mental health consequences, depression, low self-esteem, and bitter jealousy among them. And a good antidote to that is to take this card and write your parents a thank you note. Remember what you did have instead of what you didn't have. Remember who they were and not just who they weren't. You know, I've seen my wife live this out. If you looked at my wife, you would never guess that growing up, I mean, my wife, she's a wonderful lady. We've been married 39 years. Can you believe that? She's put up with me for 39 years. That qualifies her for sainthood. And if you looked at my wife, you'd never know that growing up, what a painful childhood she had that her parents went through a really nasty divorce when she was young. And boy, there was so much pain, so much hardship. I mean, real hardship. And it would have been real easy for her to become bitter about it. I mean, she didn't have what I had. I had two parents growing up. Every child should have two parents growing up. But she didn't have that. And it would have been easy for her to become bitter over what she didn't have, but I watched her make a choice. Instead of choosing to be a victim, she chose to be victorious. And even today, she chooses to focus on what she did have instead of what she didn't have. 
And what she, she did has, what, what, what she did have, she didn't have two parents in the home, but she had a mom who raised her up and a God who watched over her. And she is living a victorious life. Amen. She doesn't get stuck in the past. So who can you write a note to? Maybe it's a spiritual mom or dad. That's the cathedral challenge for the week. And that brings us to the last thing I want us to think about. That when our parents are older, we can show them honor through our support. Support. Say that with me. Support. Support. So obedience, then gratitude, and then support. And one of the mysteries of Jesus, about Jesus' life is why did he stay at home so long? He only lived 33 years, and 30 of those years, Jesus was at home. Well, one of the suggestions is that Jesus stayed home because his stepfather died early on, and so Jesus stayed at home to take care of his mom and his little brothers. And then finally, he left home at the age of 30, and he ministered, and three years later, we see him on the cross. And there's nails in his hands and thorns in his head. His life is slipping away. His enemies are taunting him. Demons are dancing around him. The weight of the salvation of the world is on his shoulders. And yet, and yet, even in this moment, his thoughts turn to his mom. And he wants to make sure his mom is going to be taken care of. And we see in John chapter 19, we read these powerful words. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside me, his close friend, he said to her, he is your son. And he said to me, John, he said, she is your mother. And from then on, I, John, took her in to my home. Jesus makes sure that his aging mother is gonna be taken care of. And some scholars believe that this is actually the main focus of this command is to make sure that aging parents were cared for. There were no social safety nets, no assisted living uh, back in that day. And this command provides a framework that those who are older would have the support that they need. Now, each of us need a lot of wisdom and discernment to know how we can carry this out with our aging parents. We do. It may be giving them a ride to the doctor. It may be helping them take care of a bill. It may be helping them to learn some technology, and that can be the hardest challenge of all. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Take a look right up here. See if you can feel his pain. Do I look like a guy who would wear a shirt with pineapples all over it? Kinda. I want to use all caps to get across how angry I am, but it takes forever to press shift before each letter. Why don't you just put on the caps lock? You can do that? Oh, Jay, just double click here. Didn't work. Well, that's because you didn't double click. You just clicked twice. Double click. See? That's exactly what I did. Double click. No, you're still just clicking twice. Listen to me. Double click, not double click. I'm not an idiot. Double click! You can't possibly think that's the same thing. It's the exact same thing! Double click! Double click! (laughs) Anybody identify with that? Yeah. It's like my grandson trying to teach me. I don't know what that would look like for you. The Bible says this in terms of caring for our aging parents, it says if a woman whose husband has died has children or grandchildren, they're the ones to care for her. And that way, they can pay back to their parents the kindness that has been shown to them. God is pleased. God is pleased when that is done. Now, there has to be at least someone who's thinking right now, oh boy, here we go. I hope my mom isn't watching this service online because you don't know my mom. She is controlling. She is manipulating. Here's a picture of my mom. She is a travel agent. She's a travel agent for guilt trips. And I'm already doing everything I can. 
I'm doing everything I can to care for her. I'm doing everything I can to care for my kids. I'm part of that sandwich generation. I have both obligations. If that's where you're at, I want you to join me right now. In fact, everybody join me right now. This is maybe the healthiest thing we've done all service. Everybody take a deep breath, breathe out, and then say with me, I am not God. Go ahead, everybody. I am not. Let's say it one more time just to make sure we all got the message. Everyone, I am not God. Only God can be everywhere and do everything. And we can't. We can do the best we can do and let God do what we can't do. So lean into that. Live into that. I mean, even Jesus himself knew what it was to have an aging parent and draw a healthy boundary. In his very first miracle, when he turned the water into wine, if you go back and look at that story, his mother comes to him and asks him to help out the wedding feast. And Jesus says to his mom, well, that he's going to help out. But he says, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. It's Jesus' way of drawing a boundary before he helps. He's saying, did you notice he didn't say mother? He said woman. No, he didn't say woman. (laughs) It was more like dear woman, dear woman. What's he doing? He's individuating. He's differentiating. He said, I'll always be your son. You'll always be my mom. But things are different now. I'm 30 years old in my public ministry, and there's a different kind of relationship that is going on. I'll always honor you. Eventually, he does help out, and the request of his mom becomes his first miracle. But even Jesus shows us that it's okay to draw a healthy boundary and still honor your mom and dad. And maybe that's what you need to do. As we wrap things up, and we get ready to receive the Lord's table. Before the 1900s, most generations lived really together. Grandparents, parents, and uh, children. They all kind of were in the same home or adjacent to each other. But things have radically changed since then. And now there's a group that demographers are calling elder orphans. And elder orphans are those folks who have either no children or no children that are close uh, to them in proximity and they've lost a spouse. And did you know that 22% of us older folks fall in to the category of elder orphans? And I was wondering, in the same way that Jesus told John, take care of my mom, if God might give us a nudge to step into the gap and to honor one of these elderly orphans. Maybe a neighbor, maybe an aunt, maybe someone here at church. I know that one of the most moving things that happened to me during the pandemic, I was so proud of the way Cathedral stepped up and served our community. In that first year of the pandemic, we distributed more than $40 million worth of food to our community members. Can we give God praise? Amen. To God be the glory. But perhaps the most meaningful ministry was not right here on our campus, but it was offsite as reaching out went mobile and we served seniors who were locked up shut in, couldn't go anywhere, the most vulnerable uh, population, and yet we were able to deliver food to them and bring them some joy and share some love. And when I did that, it just marked my soul. And we continued to do that today through our Reaching Out program. We had a chance to talk to one of the ladies, one of the recipients this week, and here is what she had to say. It's actually a wonderful thing that you 
do because a lot are on such big fixed incomes and you, you just help embrace their lives and make it easier even you know in the prayer groups and everything else and the fellowship that the church gives to us is amazing there are so many people that are confined they can't get out they don't you know they, they depend on other people to come in and get do stuff for them the volunteers are amazing i it always amazes me how many people volunteer like i volunteer a little tiny bit but when i see what the church does with volunteering and um it, it's just heartfelt uh, how much when I see the cars pulling out with all that food and who donates it it, it, it boggles your mind it boggles your mind that even with these tight uh, well now money is so tight and uh, how does the church do it how do they still give so much and where do they get it all from it's a, it's mind-boggling amen let's give God praise for our reaching out ministry Bishop E.C. Wilson, would you stand? Bishop Wilson is the director of Reaching Out. Will you let him know how much you appreciate his leadership and all that he's doing? Love you, buddy. I'm going to invite everybody to stand with me as Pastor Vaughn and the team come out. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. We prepare our hearts to receive communion, to go to the Lord's table. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your life-giving word. And we pray right now that each of us would know what it looks like to carry out that principle this week, to lean in by your grace to your law so that we can experience your life out of your love for us. I pray, God, that for those who have had painful memories with parents. God, that you would give them grace to be able to forgive. Release that pain, that failure of those parents. Lord, I pray that you would turn our hearts to gratitude. God, I pray that you would show us how we can support our aging parents and the elderly members of our community and then, Father, I pray that all of us would remember that no matter what kind of experience we had growing up, that we have a Heavenly Father Amen. who's a good, good Father. And as we prepare to come to the table, we sing and we celebrate the goodness of who you are, O oh God. Amen and amen. Pastor Vaughn, come and lead us. Searching for 
can hardly speak He's so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me It's deeper still as you call me It's deeper still as you call me It's deeper still as you love Love, love, you're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Take the elements. Thank you, Jesus, for inviting us to your table today. Thank you for the life that we find in you. It's a life-giving presence. Lord, it's through you and your grace we can be forgiven of our past, we can have power for our present, and we can have hope for our future. Let's eat of the bread of Christ together. And let's drink of the cup of Christ. Receive his life-giving power. And now I invite you to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. It's the most important prayer we'll ever pray. Would you join me in praying the Our Father? Thank you, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're in the Father's house today, amen? Pastor Vaughn, lead us. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands together with it like this. Arrival's not the end game. The journey's where you are. Never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. The failure's never final when the Father's in the room. We say, come on. A failure's never final when the Father's in the room.
sing our faith together. The prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Yes, the prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Yes, the love is on the move. That's it. Come on, miracles. with our hands and with our hearts and with our voices, with our minds. Hallelujah. God is good and all the time. Again, thanks so much for being here today. You know, if you need prayer, our team will be out in the amphitheater to pray with you and for you right after service. And I want to thank again, Councilman and your family for being with us today. Thank you so much for taking your time out. What a joy it is to have you joining us in service. Amen. Oh, Cathedral family, do you know your love today? Yeah. Amen. Boy, we've got an exciting season coming up. So I encourage you, be praying. I really believe God has some amazing things for us in these next few weeks. Let me speak God's blessing over you as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine brightly upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his peace. And I pray this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, amen. God blesses you, go.